All right, so this, is, this class is entitled Bible Warfare, How to Defend Your Faith. This is the first lesson, and the title of this lesson is The Basics. And this class is designed to help you defend your faith against questions from non-believers or comparisons um, by those people of religions that may claim Christ as their leader, but do not follow carefully the teaching of the New Testament. You know, they say, well, in America, 78% you know, of the people say that they're Christians. But you and I know that that 78% will include people that simply say, well, I kind of believe in a God, and yeah, I guess I'm a Christian, but they don't know the Bible, they haven't been baptized, they, don't, you know, they, they, they couldn't tell you uh, how they were saved. Uh, so it's a pretty generic number when they take those type of polls. Hopefully in this class you'll find the scripture or teaching that answers your friend's question or your family's objection about a particular issue. In the end, you're going to be stronger, more confident, more knowledgeable about what the Bible teaches about specific issues and subjects. And hopefully you'll be able to answer with intelligence. We're always trying to give a, an intelligent answer to a question that we're asked concerning the scripture. And of course, intelligence and love uh, to the questions and challenges may be uh, put to you by those who are not members of the church. Why do you people do that? And why do you go to church every Sunday? Why, you know, why you go to church twice a week? Why? You know, so we're, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to begin uh, by having you write out a question, a problem, a point of debate that you may have had or anticipate having with someone else concerning your faith. We don't have time to go around and have everybody discuss it, so I'd rather, while I'm teaching, while we're going through this uh, lesson, if you think of something, write it down. This is not the only day that you can do that. At any time during this, this whole series, if you have a question, uh, a comment, or somebody stuck you, you know, they asked you a question, you couldn't answer. You couldn't give a good Bible answer for something you believe. Whatever that is, write it down and I'm going to try to incorporate those questions into my class as we go from, uh, from week to week. So we're going to start with something called the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement. In any type of warfare, there are rules of engagement. One of the main reasons for this is so that the outcome of the war can be determined with the least amount of damage and loss of life as possible. I mean, that's the ideal situation. The, uh, you know, the, the warfare taking place nowadays with terrorists, there are not many rules of engagement. But anyways, uh, in normal circumstances, this is why wounded and prisoners are, are cared for. Why civilians are uh, restrained but not massacred, leaving the soldiers to fight it out. Another reason is that if you don't fight by the rules and you lose the war, the revenge extracted upon you may be quite high. Well, in Bible warfare, there are also rules of engagement for the protection of all and also to help the discussion move ahead so that the thing doesn't just break down into a stalemate. Now, realize that these rules that I'm talking about, they're not written down or they're not listed in the Bible. They're merely examples and helpful guides developed over a long period of time teaching and debating other people on the topic of religion. They're not all the rules either. Hopefully you'll be able to provide some from your own experience as well. Okay, so with that said, let's look at some of the rules of engagement when it comes to discussing or debating Bible or religious or faith issues. Rule number one. Understand that people are sincere in their beliefs, whatever those beliefs are. Regardless of the religion, the philosophical system, the faith experience, the Bible understanding, if a person uses this in their interpretation of the world and life in general, it's important to them. Just because it is different from ours, even wildly different, even if we see it as totally anti-biblical, we do great harm to our personal credibility if we assume that their views are less important to them than our views are to us. 
You know? There have been many people who have died as martyrs for causes and beliefs that are non-Christian, even atheistic in nature. For example, you have Buddhist monks. Those of you old enough to remember the Vietnam War, not, not as a documentary on TV, old enough to remember the war as it was going on. Do you not remember those images of Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire? in order to protest what was taking place? <clears throat> or going back, this is even before my time now, but going back to World War II, the Japanese kamikaze pilots, World War II, they would crash their planes into US warships on purpose because they sincerely believed that their emperor was divine and this suicide mission would guarantee their afterlife. Here's a young pilot, 25 years old, full of life, you know? Sees that American ship go by and just you know, put a beat on it and just fly it straight into the ship, killing himself, hopefully taking the ship with him. And the same idea, of course, motivates Islamic suicide bombers of today, both men and women. So members of the Church of Christ, you know, they don't have a, or we, we don't have a corner on sincerity or zeal when it comes to religion or faith. Even the pagans who lived in the land of Canaan before the Jews you know, took that land, they sacrificed their own children to their gods as a sign of their faith. They would burn their babies to the god Molech as part of their religious practice. And you're saying, well, that was long ago and that was, that was another time. You know what? Your firstborn is your firstborn. It doesn't matter if you live in Canaan 3,000 years ago, or you live in you know, Kentucky today. Your firstborn is your firstborn. So when we begin a discussion about the Bible with a person that we disagree with, whether it's a disagreement about the very existence of God or a dispute over a minor point of doctrine. We have to begin by understanding and respecting the fact that the other person feels as strongly about their point of view as we do about our point of view. And we must remember that it will be as difficult for them to change their minds as it would be for us to do so in the same circumstance. Paul says, the, the apostle Paul says, that we should speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, among ourselves as Christians. I don't think I would be twisting the scriptures if I said that we should expand this to our communication with those out of the faith as well. We should speak the truth in love to unbelievers as well. We should therefore speak the truth in love when discussing or debating matters of faith with others because they are as sensitive as we are about these matters and without a loving approach, we could wound them. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people have not become Christians because of Christians. I mean, it's a sad thing. Now some might say, well, it's impossible to share the faith or correct order or a correct error rather, or teach the word without offending somebody somehow. And that may be true. That brings me to my second rule. Stick to the Bible. Number one mistake that people make in trying to teach somebody the faith is they try to do it without the Bible. <laughs> We get into more problems and emotional turmoil because we go from discussing what the Bible says or doesn't say to judging opinions, habits, traditions, feelings. For example, in commenting on the Roman Catholic practice of having a religious service at midnight on Christmas morning, some may say, well, that's dumb. You go to church at midnight at Christmas. Well, I never heard anything as goofy as that in my life. But for those like myself, who grew up in Catholic Quebec 
where this was a cherished tradition, that would be extremely insulting and hurtful to say that to a person. As Christians, our task in regards to other people, whether they be fellow Christians or people who follow other religions or complete atheists, our task is always the same. It's very clear, it's easy to understand, but because of our sinful natures and ignorance, it's not always easy to do. Our task is given to us in Matthew 28, 20 by Jesus. He says we must do what? Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, he says. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This task does not involve our feelings or our opinions, only the word of the Lord. So if you happen to be getting into a discussion and you feel you know, it's going to get a little deeper, the, please put this down in your notes. The first thing you need to do is go, oh, hang on just a second, I got a Bible here somewhere. I got one in my car, let me go get that. My Bible's on my desk in the, in the, in the, in the bedroom. Let me just go get that, just before we continue. So here's some very important reasons for rule number two. It's biblical. <laughs> Stick to the Bible, why? Because it's biblical. Sticking to the word is how the word itself tells us to debate and discuss with others about faith. Really? Yeah. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. And, and here's the point here, and profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So Paul tells a young preacher, Timothy, that it is the word of God that has the ability to instruct someone in matters of faith. He says that it is the word of God that is to be used as the standard for proving or disproving the validity and truthfulness of any idea or religious claim. That's what reproof is. It is the word of God that is to be used to adjust a mistaken idea or proposal in spiritual matters. That's what correction is. It is the word of God that is to be used to train a person in how to live a pleasing life before God or how to serve Him or how to worship Him. That's called training. So the Bible itself tells us that we should use it in trying to convince, debate, or teach other people. Another reason to use the word and not opinions or feelings is the following. It keeps the debate in perspective. So important. A lot of times when a religious discussion gets ugly and bitter, it's because it becomes personal. Comments like, well, what a stupid idea. Oh yeah, you're going to get far with that attitude. Or that's not the way we do it at my church. Almost invites the, uh, almost invites the response. Well, then if you don't like it, then go to your church. <laughs> or my preacher says that you people are all going to hell. And his name is Marty, by the way, that preacher, <laughs> not me personally. Religion and faith are deeply personal things and just discussing them with someone else is a very risky thing. I mean, you're afraid of being wrong or you're afraid of looking ignorant. You're afraid of being rejected. That's the hard one, isn't it? Being rejected, you, you open the door to a bit of a religious discussion and you're just afraid the person is going to go, oh, are you serious? You want to talk to me about religion? Good grief. I thought you were better than that. <laughs> wow. Who wants to hear that? So religion and faith, very personal, very risky. Try to remember that the discussion is not between your church versus their church. Your faith versus their faith. Your ideas and traditions and leaders versus theirs. To be productive, Non-confrontational and edifying, a religious discussion should be framed in the following perspective. How do our respective beliefs, faith, 
religions line up with the Bible. You have an idea about something, about communion, let's say. The trap is, oh, well, let me tell you what I think. Yeah, we don't do it that way. And let me tell you why we don't do it that way. And, and at the same time, I'll show you why you're wrong. I mean, it's just human. An idea is put forth, what should happen is, well, okay, that, you know, why don't we see what the scripture says about that? Period, not what I say, just. When I became a Christian, I studied with the, the preacher, uh, Jim Metter, and um, I, it's not like the first time I had discussed religion with somebody. I had discussed religion with lots of people, but it was the first time that someone had ever set aside their opinions and began teaching me straight from the scriptures. I had a question. He said, what's your question? And I forget, something like, you know, whatever. You know, what is baptism about? You know? And he said, okay. He had his Bible. He go, Ch -ch 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 -ch. read that. And I read it. He says, what does it say? I said, well, it says this and that and the other. Okay. He says, have I put words in your mouth? No, no. Is that what it says? Yep. Okay, next question. Read it. What's it say? What do you think it says? That's how he taught me. That's how I trusted him. I trusted him because he showed me the answer from the Bible, not from him. This puts Jesus and his word on one side and ourselves and the people we are discussing religion with on the other. For example, it looks like this. Jesus is on one side and all of us are on the other. We hold all of our beliefs, including our own, up to the light of God's word. So when you do it this way, you, your partner, others, opinions, when all of that is on one side and the Bible is on the other, then that makes you and that person partners in the search for truth, not adversaries. And the key is I'm, I'm wanting to be your partner in, in moving forward in our understanding of the scriptures. Because you don't always hit a person that is totally ignorant of the Bible. Sometimes you hit someone who really does know the Bible well. And that's a more challenging kind of study because you know, you, they have an opinion about exactly what it says. So a simple example of this type of approach would be a discussion with a Baptist, for example, or a Methodist friend concerning baptism. I use that because it's such a basic teaching. The, the debate would never end if it were approached with the idea that we would argue, what does the Church of Christ teach versus what, what, does the, what do Baptists teach? The discussion becomes more fruitful, less acrimonious, if we put it into this perspective. Let's study what the Bible teaches about baptism and discuss what we learn. It's because we're competitive. Some, you know, it's hard having a discussion without having a winner and a loser. And if, you, if, you become, if you're baptized because you lost an argument, that's, that's not good. You, you need to be baptized because you're convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and you are a sinner. And His cross has taken care of your sins. That's a good reason to be baptized. Not because you lost an argument uh, over whether baptism is by sprinkling or by immersion. Uh, that, that baptism is by sprinkling or immersion, that, there's nothing of the gospel there. That's method, that's form. Nobody will become a martyr for the fact that baptism is by immersion versus by sprinkling. Nobody will die for that idea. But many have died for the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, I'll die for that idea. Now don't get me wrong, I, 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 I'm, I'm not uh, negating the importance of baptism, of course and its proper method, of course. But winning an argument about how it should be done, this is not preaching the gospel. 
So there may not be immediate agreement. It's okay to have a discussion without having closure right then and there, that the other person agrees with you, or you know, it's okay to leave it open-ended. Nothing wrong with that. Made a little progress, had some dialogue. You looked at his scriptures, he looked at your scriptures, but both of you are looking at the thing. He said what he thought, you thought we'd, maybe he said something that you couldn't answer. Okay, and you went to a class like this, and you wrote down, well, he said such and such, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know which scripture to go to. So there may not be immediate agreement. The other side may not accept certain conclusions that we readily approve of, but communication will happen and God's word will be read and discussed and perhaps the discussion will end well with the desire to continue. Why? Because there's respect. We respect each other. I'm not just out to win an argument. I'm not just out to put a notch on my gun. You know? So if you keep the discussion between people's beliefs and God's word and not between your idea versus their idea, then you have a better chance of actually teaching God's word um, and will rather than your own. Rule number three, be patient. <laughs> Some folks don't understand that just because a person understands in in intellectually in their head the teachings of the Bible, it doesn't mean that they believe and accept in their heart the teachings of Christ. That's, that's the longest trip from here to here. This is a very long journey for people. For example, the apostles were with Jesus for three years and yet it took almost 10 years after His resurrection for them to understand that the gospel was meant for the entire world and not just for the Jews in the entire world. 10 years, a decade. There are many obstacles that stand in the way of faith other than ignorance of the doctrines. For example, loyalty to family and church group. As a Catholic, when Lise and I, I was, I was baptized first and Lise soon after, a few months later, she was baptized. And I want to tell you that our families did not accept that at all. I mean at all. My mother didn't want to talk about it. Her mother didn't. Want, they were polite. They were nice. We got invited to you know, Christmas and all that kind of stuff. You know. But they didn't want to talk about it at all. They were disappointed. Bad experiences with religion. Remember I said so many people have been chased out of uh, church by, by other Christians over petty things. Yeah, well, she lets her daughter wear makeup. She's 14. I don't know what kind of Christian she is. I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah, I really want to go back to that church. Culture, culture. In Quebec, where I grew up, the best one I know because it's my own experience. I mean, when I was growing up, 95% of the people in the province of Quebec were Catholic, 95%. You're talking about the premier of the province, every mayor in every city, every, every fire chief, every police chief, every, everybody was Catholic. In the 1950s in Quebec, you couldn't even get a permit to hold a public meeting, religious meeting of another religion other than Roman Catholicism. Talk about a closed culture. So I can understand when Lise and I you know, became Christians, New Testament Christians, our parents were like, they couldn't even get their brain around it. I mean, the closest they came was that we were Protestant. <laughs> I mean, forget about, oh, we're a non-denominational Bible church, you know, we're a New Testament, <laughs> are you kidding? I could have been speaking Chinese, they wouldn't have understood. My mother, ben, we, you protestant, you know, in French, you protestant, he's a Protestant now, what do you, go figure. <laughs> she, said, she said, well, he lasts two years, two years, he'll get over it in two years. It's just a phase, just a phase. The fear of change. You, you've been a whatever 
for 42 years, and all of a sudden you see in the Bible, you understand it, you get it intellectually. Yeah, what you've been taught is not biblical. It may have been sincere and so on, but it's just not really according to God's word. But for 42 years you've been like that. Changing that means I'm not going to go to the church where I grew up and I, I know everybody, everybody knows me. Now I'm going to be in this other church where I don't know anybody and nobody knows me. The fear of change, very difficult. And I mean, I could go on, you know, you, you've got a couple, you study with a couple, she gets it, she really does. It's what she's been looking for. Yes, yeah, she's baptized, but not him. He's just not even interested in religion. Period, never mind the Bible. You know, he's, he's going along with it to kind of humor his wife and he's trying to be supportive. You know. But then she, she becomes a Christian and then on Sunday morning she starts going to church. Well, wait a minute, she starts going to church on Wednesday night. And then she wants to go to church on Sunday night. And then there's a, a women's retreat and he's at home. What happened to my wife? Yeah. I mean, that's real stuff. You know, that's, that's what happened in real people's lives. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, I came to bring a sword, you know, a mother against the son and a father against his daughter. And, you know, absolutely. And of course, people love sin. That's the other thing. <laughs> the light came into the world, but the world what? Did not come to the light. Why? Because it loved the darkness. People, people get it intellectually, but it means, oh, oh I'm going to have to give up whatever. I'm going to have to give up what I consume illegally. I'm going to have to stop cheating on my wife. I'm going to have to, you know, I had one person studied with her and her daughter and the daughter got it. Yes, she wanted to be baptized. The mother, she understood. Yes, I get it. Yes, this is the truth. This is what I want to do. But she said, no, I'm not going to do it. I said, why not? She says, because I sleep over at my boyfriend's every weekend. She was a single mom. She says, I sleep over at my boyfriend's every weekend. And if, if I go with this, I won't be able to do that. He doesn't want to get married. That was it. You know, stalemate. Where do I go from there? Stay in touch, come to church anyways, you know, but she couldn't get over that bump. And of course, some people are just comf they're comfortable in the way things are. Don't rock the boat. So when we're discussing religious issues with someone, we need to remember that all of these issues and more may be affecting the other person's response. Do we think that if we explain the five steps, you know, hear, believe, confess, repent, be baptized, you know, we say, I preach the gospel to them. I mean, how many ways do I have to explain? Hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess Christ and be immersed in water. I've explained the gospel. Well, yeah, you may have explained the nuts and bolts of the thing, but that doesn't mean you've changed their heart. We need to be willing to keep the discussion and the interchange going as long as the other person is willing to share and exchange ideas. This business of, well, you know, we, we've had two studies, I've explained the five steps, you know, and they're not responding. I guess I'm just a moving on to another, you know, another prospect. These are people. <laughs> they're people. We're not selling encyclopedias. You know, we're not selling vacuum cleaners door to door here. This is eternal life we're talking about. It's okay to be patient, to wait. So many people have been turned away from Christ because they were approached by people who were in a hurry to convert them without taking the time to understand them and their issues. That little mama that you have a study with who's got two kids by two different guys, she's got a lot of baggage. Does she need Christ? Boy, does she ever need Christ. Does she require patience? Oh yeah. She got a long way to go with that girl. And a lot of times people don't say it, but inside they're saying, I understand that you know what you're teaching me is true, but do you love me? Do you even care about me? 
So some are won over quickly and others have many obstacles and need time to think about and accept the points you may be making concerning the Bible, so be patient. You know, I'm willing to love a guy who will not convert. I'm still willing to love him until he dies. I'll weep over him because he didn't, he didn't accept Christ. But I'll stick with you to the end. It's okay, I, I'm not denying Christ because I happen to love somebody who refuses to be, quote, baptized. So when we engage someone in a discussion about religion, about questions concerning the Bible, we need to remember three rules of engagement in order to avoid bad feelings and of course wasting our time. We don't want to waste our time either. Very quickly, give people credit for being as sincere as you are. This demonstrates true Christian love and respect, not for religious uh, practices that may be false, but rather for people's genuine effort to serve God. Some people genuinely love God, they just have this backwards. We're just trying to teach them the right way. Respect will set the tone of the exchange and enable the person to truly listen to what you are saying. If you offend them with your disrespectful attitude, they won't hear a word you're saying. They may listen politely, but they're not hearing you. Study God's word, not your opinions. The biggest mistake people make in religious discussion is that they don't even open their Bible. Do you know, I'll, I'll tell you something, it's such a little banal thing, okay? Some people are embarrassed to study because they don't understand how to even, they don't understand the language of Bible study, they don't understand chapter one, verse two, <laughs> first Corinthians, second Corinthians, you know, that, that's normal for us. They've never read the Bible, they don't know how to, well, what was it, President Trump, he was speaking where, at Liberty University, and what did he say? Two Corinthians. Oh, and the newspapers had a field day with that. You know, and he didn't say second Corinthians, he said two Corinthians. Or like people uh, who are using the, the last book of the Bible, they say, in Revelations, uh, yes. Yeah, right away we spot, uh-oh, fake. You know, it's singular, Revelation. So some people won't study because they're afraid of being embarrassed by their ignorance of the, of the Bible, just how to handle it. They don't know where to go. Old Testament, New Testament, they don't know that. And if they open the Bible and start asking questions and studying, they're going to reveal what they don't know. And people don't like to reveal what they don't know. And especially if you're some kind of whiz that's, you know, never mind open the book, you're quoting from memory, whoa. Find the passage, keep the debate centered on understanding what the Bible says about the issue, not various positions of different groups. And finally, be patient. You are sharing in order to teach somebody more perfectly the way and the word of the Lord. This requires patience. If all you want to do is win an argument, you need skill and intelligence. But if you want to win a soul, this requires love and patience in addition to skill and intelligence. Okay, so some of these rules guide our discussions with other people and uh, we'll stop there. We're going to continue next week. Thank you very much.